so clear, so nice out. Wow. So a couple months ago, when we were hauled out in Bridgeport, Connecticut, getting the shipping damaged, repaired, I installed our Rainman water maker. And it took me a while to get the electrical ran the way I wanted to get it run. And then we haven't been around really super clear, calm water to test it. Um, but we are today, we're right next to the inlet and we have a nice incoming tide, calm out in the ocean. So just beautiful, clear water. I don't know if you guys can see that. So it's time to finally put the water maker to the test, make sure everything's running right and make sure I don't have any leaks, which if we have zero leaks, we'll be kind of lucky, I think. I always have like one or two little minor, minor leaks I have to tighten. But first, here is the install of the whole water maker. We have a rainy day in the boatyard, and while we're still in the boatyard, while they're fixing the shipping damage back there, we're gonna install our water maker. So here's the water maker we're gonna be installing today. It's a naked version of the electric AC power high output model. And naked just means it's not their portable one. It's one that's meant to be installed in a boat permanently. And this is the same water maker we installed on Adrenaline, our last catamaran, a few years ago. We didn't realize what a huge game changer having a water maker on board would be until we did install that unit on Adrenaline four or five years ago in the Caribbean. It absolutely freed us up from having to go to a dock to fill up with fresh water. And it just allowed us to be out cruising in more remote places and just be on anchor in more remote places, especially in places like the Bahamas, but also the Caribbean as well. In a lot of those places, water can be kind of expensive. So we're actually saving a bit of money if we're cruising in remote areas of the Bahamas for long periods of time. But the biggest benefit is just being self-sufficient and being able to stay out in remote areas as long as we wanted and just being able to make our own water. So what is a water maker? A water maker is basically just a system that takes salt water from outside your boat and using a high pressure pump that pushes it through a filter which we call a reverse osmosis membrane and the membrane is fine enough where only completely fresh water can pass through. So it blocks all the salt and minerals and even bacteria and viruses and stuff like that. And on the opposite side of those membranes, your completely clean fresh water flows into your fresh water tank and a solution of brine or really salty water gets dumped overboard. So it's a relatively simple concept. There are a few more components that we have that are integrated within that system and we'll get to discussing each of those components as we go through the install. But Basically, we have our pump, and it's actually two pumps in one. A lower pressure lift pump, this is what gets the water from outside the boat through a through hole, pushes it through this primary filter, this initial filter, and then it flows into the high pressure pump, which is on the back side of this pump unit. And that high pressure pump is what then pushes that water through these high output membranes. We actually have two membranes so that we can produce a lot more water in any given period of time. And then that water flows into our fresh water tank and like I said before, the brine solution just gets dumped overboard. We also have this control box that lets us see the flow rate and a built-in TDS tester so we can make sure that our water is up to quality and a diverter valve here, a pressure gauge for our pre-filter, and a few other components. So this is basically the control panel that will control the whole system. Before we get to installing this unit, let's talk about some of the different options of water makers out there. There's electric, and you can have an AC powered water maker or a DC powered water maker, or there can be engine driven alternators where combustion engine drives a belt and that belt drives the water maker pumps. And that can be an inboard diesel engine on your boat, or it can even be an external gasoline engine dedicated to the water maker system. The most realistic choice for us was an electric powered water maker, so our real decision was to use AC power or DC power. In the past on the adrenaline, we used AC power and it worked really well, although we got that AC power from our 2000 watt Honda gasoline generator that we already had on board. On this boat, we do not have that Honda generator. We're probably not ever going to have that Honda generator. However, both our engines have a high output alternator in addition to their regular alternator. The high output alternators on each engine are 120 amps each. We also have a much bigger lithium battery bank than we've ever had before and more solar power than we've ever had before. 
basically don't have any need for an external gasoline generator. And it is nice to not have to carry that extra weight and have another thing on board. Our electrical system on board is 12 volts, so in my mind it made a lot of sense to research uh, 12 volt water makers. So obviously there's still pros and cons to each type of water maker, whether it's 12 volt DC or AC. As I learned more and more, I realized that for us there may be more cons to a 12 volt DC powered water maker than the AC powered water maker, the same water maker we had on Adrenaline. One of the huge disadvantages of 12 volt DC water makers is that the production rate is much much lower where this water maker can make 26 to 37 gallons per hour a DC version might only make around 9 gallons per hour and on the pro side it might be more efficient because you're not running it through a power inverter which inherently is slightly inefficient and has losses up to 10% However, when I was looking at Rayman's DC option versus the AC option, I ran all the numbers and I quickly broke down how many watts it would take to produce a gallon of water from a DC water maker was actually higher than how much it would take to produce a gallon of water from an AC water maker. Now, there are other brands out there that are a bit more energy efficient because they have energy recovery pumps built into the system, but now you're getting into a much more expensive and complicated system and a lot more proprietary parts that are a nightmare to replace if you're off in remote areas of the world. And a big advantage that most people don't realize with AC powered water makers is not only is their production rate a lot, lot higher, I quoted 26 to 37 gallons per hour for this unit, which in the Caribbean on Adrenaline, we were seeing 36 gallons per hour pretty consistently. It really depends on how warm the water is. The warmer the water, the higher the production rate, as well as how clean the water is, things like that. But in short, we made a lot of water really fast and that was really nice because we only had to run the water maker a couple hours like once a week and we had all the water we needed so that means we could dedicate a couple hours to being on board just cleaning the boat while the water maker was running and then be able to shut the unit down before we went off and did anything else we wanted to do go to shore or go spear fishing or diving or anything like that and that's opposed to a 12 volt DC water maker where it only makes eight nine gallons per hour so it's gonna be running all day long to top off your water tank. Now, I've heard of some people just letting that run all day long and they get off their boat and they go do their errands or go, you know, have some fun or whatever. And to me, I just don't feel comfortable leaving a water maker running while I'm not aboard. I'd like to be aboard and just kind of keep checking in on it just in case something happens. I mean, what if you get a piece of debris in the water that clogs the through hole and now at least if you're on board, you can hear the change in your pump and kind of check out what's going on instead of burning out your water maker. All right, let's get to installing this thing. These obviously are the biggest components to this unit, the control panel, the pump, and the membranes. They're gonna be the hardest components to find a place to live that's nice and neat and out of the way and where they fit. Um, but I did a whole bunch of measuring and mocking up and I actually found the perfect place, I think, for each of them. And I even already tabbed in a shelf for the water pump and a big mounting board for the membranes. So I just used some marine plywood that we had laying around and I coated it all in epoxy and I tabbed it in and I glued this to one of the bulkheads we have in the engine room on the port side. So that should be all cured. So let's get the pump in there and just make sure that fits and we'll get that mounted. And then we'll also get the membranes, just mock them up and then we'll mount the frame that holds the membranes and then put the membranes up in there. All right, so here's our pump. We're in the port head right now. So this cabinet below the sink is where I mounted a nice little shelf. And that's where we're gonna install it, right back in there, right up here. It's really good because the through hole is directly under us in here. So we'll just run the line up from that through hole through the floor here, right into this compartment. We'll have it to the pump and then the filter and then to the membrane back under the floor into the membrane, which is gonna be in the engine compartment. Jetty will see what's going on over here. What's going on? <laughs> I mounted this shelf, but let's just get this thing in here and make sure it fits anyway. Uh, can I get in there, please? Yeah, can I go in there? Thank you. Come over here, sit, stay. So, wow, 
That fits perfectly. So this pump is air cooled, so it needs some ventilation around it to keep it cool. They say you do not want the air ambient temperature around it to be more than 104 degrees. So in reality, when we run this water maker, we're gonna have to keep this open, um, but that should be fine besides that. Why don't we add a little white vent that they have everywhere? Yeah, we could add a little white, a little vent right here, like a little circular vent right here. That'd be fine too, yeah. Oh, and you also wanna be able to access a little switch on here and the water pump as well. Oh, right on top here. So that's easy enough to access. And then the lift pump is just like an impeller water pump. And that's right here. So super easy to access if we have to change that impeller in the future. All right, so here's our membranes. And we're gonna put these in the engine room. All right, so I glued up a pad in there the other day, mounting pad. So I just want to get these membranes in here, just make sure my measurements were right. And now we're gonna unscrew this molded uh, case and we'll install the case first. And then we'll bring the membranes back in and lock them into this case. I remember last time on adrenaline, just makes it so much easier to mount, mount these things. Um, so all we got to do is just screw it right into the pad and then I'll be able to bring the uh, membranes in separately and just put them up there and put four these four Allen bolts with these things over and lock them in. So it is a really good thing that I glued this pad to this bulkhead here because those screws are super long. If I didn't, they definitely would have gone through. And on the other side of this is the interior, the shower. So without that, I mean, we could have used shorter screws, but um, we want that holding power. And we have a little bit more surface area that's completely glued to the bulkhead. We also actually do have some mechanical screws in there as well. I use those to help clamp it to the bulkhead while it cured. So this thing is rock solid. I can hang on this thing. It's not going anywhere. Perfect. Thank goodness. You guys thought of everything. They made this lower lip of this case uh, longer than the upper lip. So I can just place this in here and it kind of rests on this lower lip. Which is really good. So we got some clearance on both sides. Yeah, I think we're good. So now we'll screw these, uh, bolt these things back in. So there's the membranes just above the engine room door. Not really any usable space up there. So as soon as I saw this space and how wide it was, I was like, oh, I think the membranes can, can fit up there. And I was really excited. And sure enough, I measured it and I was like, oh, that's perfect. Completely out of the way. And I think the back of the control panel will come out right here. So we can do a bunch of our connections back there. And I'll show you where the front of that is. All right, so this is our master shower on the port hull and we just mounted the membranes on the back side of this bulkhead right here right above this little fire extinguisher port and i think that the perfect spot for the control panel is going to be up in this corner now it makes sense location wise there's a perfect empty bulkhead space right here um easily accessible and the back of it where all the connections are made are right where it needs to be um at least for the membranes now the only disadvantage is that obviously we're in a shower, so it might get a little splash of water here and there. They make like a hatch enclosure, like if you wanted to mount the control panel 
on the bulkhead where it's exposed to the outside of the boat, like um, like exposed into the cockpit or something like that. And then you can put this hatch cover and close it, but the footprint of that hatch cover is much bigger than the control panel itself. And they agreed with me that the occasional splash of fresh water is not gonna do any damage to it. Any important components on it that can't get wet are sealed, so it should be just fine. So that's gonna be uh, the perfect spot for right there. So here's the uh, control panel cutting template that Rainman provides. So we're going to cut this out and just put it up in place, tape it to the shower bulkhead, and I'll cut it out. And then we can put the front of the control panel in and mark where the screw holes are, and I'll screw it in there. I just realized he's cutting a giant hole in the wall. <laughs> it's necessary. This will be the biggest hole. He cuts in the boat so far. Woo. How's that right there? Lined up vertically with uh, with the corner of the wall, right? Does it look straight to you? I don't know. Isn't there like a more technical way of making a shirt no, straight? No, because it's on the boat. We might have to clean up the edges a bit, go a little bit further with the sand or something, but we'll see if it fits. Yeah, right about there. That's gonna be, that's perfect. Huh? some parts in today, some plumbing pieces, and most importantly, uh, our strainer and our three quarter inch hose. So we're gonna build the inlet side of the water maker from where the water, the salt water comes from outside the hole through the through hole that we already have in there. It goes through this strainer and through a few valves before it goes into the first pump of the water maker system. The through hole that we're using for this water maker, we are going to be sharing with the future air conditioning system. Oh, what? Uh, I don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the biggest bunch of baloney I've ever heard. I you know. complain more at night than I do. No, I do not. <laughs> yes, you do. So to share a through hole, hole, it's not ideal, but like everything on a boat, everything is a compromise. And I think this is a fine compromise because we'll realistically never, ever, ever run the water maker at a dock and if we're going to the, run the air conditioning 99.9% .9 of the time it's going to be at a dock so it's not like these two 
the systems will ever draw out of the same through hole at the same time and they'll each have their own ball valve on either side of it and probably a check valve as well so there's no chance of either one pulling air from the other system or pulling water from the other system. Using thread sealant and just screwing together all the intake components I mocked it up in its space it looks good I marked the holes for the bracket for this screen and I think this is the last uh, last component here. Yep. Now we'll tighten this up a bit. I like to use thread sealant a lot better than tape. Just think it seals better. Here we go. There's our intake system. So basically the water's gonna go from the through hole through this strainer. We'll skip this T. It's got a little plug in it for now, but in the future that'll be the AC system that goes down there. Um, and we'll replace that plug with a metal plug, a stainless plug or something. And then uh, it goes through this three-way valve and goes out into the pump from, from here, straight into the pump. Pump it through the pre-filter, then into the high-pressure pump, then through the membranes, and then it'll get spit out as clean water and salty brine water overboard. And then this port is for just a hose that'll live there, a loose hose that we can pickle this system in the future. So if we were leaving um, the boat for more than a week or two, we can stick this hose in a bucket with the solution that they have for pickling and suck up all that pickle solution. And then our water maker system is safe to leave for a while until we're back at the boat. So we also have auto flush system and I'll explain a little bit more about how that works and the plumbing for that. It's relatively simple. It's just a solenoid valve on a timer um, and it uses the, the pressure from the fresh water system aboard to flush the water maker and the membranes um, every week or whatever you set the timer to automatically. You don't necessarily have to use the water maker once a week or less than that um, and you don't have to pickle it. The auto flush will keep everything fresh and keep it from going bad um, if you forget to do that or if you don't want to do that for a week or two. But I don't think you're supposed to spend uh, depend on it any longer than that. You're supposed to pickle it if you know you're not going to be at the boat for an extended period of time. But anyway, let's get this uh, whole intake system mounted and then we'll get the rest of the hose mounted and that'll almost be complete at that point. Hey love, can you do me a favor? Got it mounted, I gotta trim these zip ties. Got our strainer. When we want water to be coming from our pickle hose, we have the valve in this, valve in this position. And when we want water to be coming from the through hole, from outside the boat, we'll have the valve in that position. You can see there's little markings right on the valve there. I think I have to swap this handle. So it says seawater intake. Yeah, so this handle slides off because we can flip it and now it says pickle water intake. When it's to the right, like how it is now, and then seawater intake when it's to the left, like it is now. There we go. Here's our three quarter inch hose with a wire reinforcement. It's a trident, proper hose to be used below the water line. So this will go from the through hole to that strainer. We'll do double hose clamps, just again, because it's below the water line. We'll have redundancy if one of these fails. Um, we have backup.
país. It's time to test this thing. Um, we've been charging up. We will be running off the inverter because we're not plugged into shore power. Um, we got an engine on charging right now, but we don't necessarily need that. It's just a matter of how long we could run it for off the batteries and then if our solar can replace that energy um, that the water maker uses. But while the engine's running right now, we'll run the water maker as well and we'll kind of just, batteries are kind of a pass through in a way. So here is our test water line. I didn't plumb it anywhere yet. Um, it's just gonna, I don't know, maybe I'll put a little fitting right through there so it comes out right there. But now it's just hanging. That's our test water. Maybe we'll tuck it in this bungee so it squirts straight down. Don't really want it along that door, but I think that's fine. All right, here it goes. All right, so there's our pump. We've got a switch on the top of the pump. I'm not gonna be able to get the camera up there for you guys to see, but that's what it looks like. I just took a picture for myself. So when the switch is flicked in the left position, it's on the panel that controls it. And if it's flicked in the right position, the pump is, it just turns the pump on. And if it's neutral, then it's off. So we have it flicked in the panel position. So this panel should be controlling everything. And it's off right now. So what we're gonna do, we have our valve off, we have our panel in the off position, and we have our water to divert. So we'll turn it on, pump should turn on. There it goes. We're pumping from the through hole, through the strainer, through the lift pump, into the pre-filter, through the high-powered pump, into the membranes, and then all of the water right now is coming out through the green brine line because we haven't uh, pressurized the system yet. So everything seems good. We have our little test hose here. We're gonna start to increase this pressure slowly. As we start to make water, it's gonna come out of this test hose. And then once we're satisfied with the water coming out of this test hose, we'll switch this valve and it'll just go right into the, the tank. So here we go, I'll start to slowly pressurize the system. There we go, that looks good, so let's taste it. Taste fresh. And our water quality light is green, so that means we have a acceptable level of TDS, total dissolved sediment, or total dissolved solids, one or the other, I forget. So let's divert it to the tank now. So there we go, now we should be producing fresh water from the salt water, it should be going right to the tank. Right from, I'll show you the fitting here. So right through this fitting here, we're going right into the tank right now. Got a vacuum in there. And we should start to see our water level increase. We should be making close to probably 36 gallons an hour or so. We're making some water. And then we have the brine water, everything that gets filtered out through the membranes. Um, kind of gets flushed as brine, and that's going overboard right now.
So we're done making water now. So we are going to turn this thing off and I'll show you how we do that and use the auto flush as well. So we're gonna pull our product water line out because uh, we're gonna divert it back to this one as we uh, decrease the pressure. Yep, and then we'll decrease the pressure. So the pressure is all the way off now. And now we just turn the unit off. And instead of staying in that off position, we're going to turn it to auto flush. And then right now in a few seconds, the auto flush solenoid valve will open up and the fresh water from our tank uh, will flush through the whole system and flush it out. And that auto flush is already set every six or seven days that auto flush solenoid valve will automatically open and it'll automatically auto flush if you haven't had a chance to use what your water maker in that time period so that your membranes don't go bad. And if you do happen to use the water maker inside that six or seven day period, then that's all good. You auto flush it anyway at the end. We have fresh water flushing through our water maker system right now and that solenoid valve will stay open for a few minutes until it's all flushed and then it'll automatically close and we're good. We don't do anything else. So just made like, I don't know, 40 gallons of water. There's the auto flush timer back there. I don't know if you guys can see that. And then here's the auto flush solenoid valve and that's teed into our fresh water line. Here we go. All right, we got fresh water.